Come on, let's everybody in the auditorium just begin to lift your hands and worship the King. Come on, everybody watching on Zoom, in our Zoom rooms, anybody watching online, I just dare you just for a second just to press into the presence of God. It is in His presence where you find joy. It is in His presence where you find fulfillment. It's in His presence where you find peace and comfort it's inside of the world, and not outside in the world, not in culture, but in the comfort of a counselor where God sent his son Jesus to be at home with us in our hearts, in our minds. And I love the fact right now that we're not one church in one location, but we're one church in thousands of locations all around the world, right where you are right now. The presence of God is with you. It's with you. I love that. Uh, I love that thought that there's power, not just in the name of Jesus, but that power is, is signified, that power is significant in the blood of Jesus. And I love that this, like, if you will, this preamble or this, or this pre, uh, uh, you know, resurrection moment all the way back in Egypt when the Israelites were, were, were under oppression from Pharaoh when God sends Moses and says, let my people go. And, and uh, it, it's amazing that whole passage of scripture. And I know that they crossed the Red Sea. And I know that, you know, that they eventually, uh, as a generation, you know, made it across into the promised land. But one specific moment I'm reminded of, I'm reminded of the moment where, when, when God had sent the plagues and he told, he told the Israelites to sacrifice uh, you know, the firstborn animal and to paint the blood over the doorpost. And, and the Bible says that it's so amazing how the Bible says that because they took time to sacrifice, come on somebody, the choicest lamb and paint it over the doorpost that that house was protected and generations was protected. Can I just encourage you right now in the studio on Zoom online that right now it's the blood of Jesus that protects your house. It's the blood of Jesus that protects your family. It's the blood of Jesus that has gone before you and I'm not talking about something weird but I'm talking about when Jesus died on that cross it was his blood that was shed for you and that blood covered you that while he was on a three-day journey to hell to get the keys to the kingdom to unlock your future to unlock your destiny God sent Jesus to live to leave his home so that he could be at home with you because of the blood of Jesus come on somebody happy right there Come on, why don't you give somebody an air high five and tell them that's what's up if you're in the studio. Come on, why don't y'all type in the chat if you're watching on Zoom Room, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Online, nothing but the blood of Jesus. You can have your seats, uh, if you will. I'm so pumped uh, to deliver this word. Uh, I, honestly, I feel, like a, I feel like an overnight FedEx delivery guy because I feel like God put a word in my heart that I'm supposed to give to you. And I'm, I'm gonna, I, I said this on Instagram. I don't know how to like get the message out. I don't know who you need to send this to, who you need to text right now, no matter where you're watching and say, hey, tune into this message. I don't feel like I'm the greatest preacher. I don't feel like that I'm most prolific, but I know today I am on assignment and I don't believe that there's ever been a word that I've ever spoken that's more relevant for the season that you're in right now. This crazy COVID and the, ups and the ups and downs of life and the uncertainty of what we feel and the fear and people dying and there's loss uh, and there's trouble and there's turmoil and there's uncertainty. And I believe that God told me to steady the ship today. That God has a word right now for you and uh, whether you're watching online or in the Zoom rooms or here in the studio, I'm just going to ask you to, to lean into this word. And, and, and I'm so... I'm so uh, uh, on assignment, I said, I don't need a handheld because I don't want to preach this. I want you to hear this. I'm going to deliver this message that I believe God has, has, uh, has given to me. I want you to open your Bibles and turn it to Matthew chapter 11. Uh, we're going to go through verse 28 and 30. And then Jeremiah 6, 16 will be our main uh, topic or our main text today. And, and we're going to pick through this passage of scripture. And I believe God has something for you today. Amen. How many of y'all are expecting a word from God today? Not a word from Pastor Jimmy, but a word from God. It says here in Matthew 11, 28 and 30, then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. And isn't it amazing that this is the pre-qualifier of an invitation to be with Jesus? It doesn't say come with me, all of you who are perfect. 
It doesn't say come to me, all of you who got it all together and have dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's. It doesn't say come to me, all of you who have faith, all of you who are worshipers. It says come to me in the pre-qualifier of an invitation with Jesus is all who are weary and carry heavy burdens. How many of you by show of hands or, or here in the studio or on, on, on Zoom room or, or maybe just a hand emoji on, online would say, man, I qualify for that. Come on. I qualify to be with Jesus. It says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. It doesn't say I will give you relief. It says I'll give you rest. It doesn't say I'll regenerate you. It says I'll give you rest here. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. And it says, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you, watch this, will find rest, not for your situation, but for your soul. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. How many of y'all just would love to trade in heavy and hard for easy and light? Come on, somebody. I don't know about you. I would love to trade in heavy and hard for easy and light. Jeremiah 6, 16. It says this. It says, this is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old godly way and walk in it. Travel its path and you will find rest for your souls. I want to preach to you over the next few minutes from the topic soul satisfaction. Come on, if you're in the studio audience, can you just look at the person you're sitting next to and say soul satisfaction. If you're online or in a Zoom room, come on, type right there in the chat, soul satisfaction. Father, I pray that you do something amazing through this word. Father, I pray, God, that the presence of God transition and transfer and transform every household, every person who is listening to the sound of my voice, whether live or will listen to this on a replay. God, I pray, God, that they be better through this. God, I pray that you give them peace that surpasses their own understanding, God. God, don't just change their situation. Don't remedy their situation. But God, let them resolve that you are in control in their soul, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Y'all ready for church? Let's go. I got a message. We started off with Irene, Pastor Irene. Y'all, come on, can we give it up for Pastor Irene who absolutely killed it last week talking about peace. And I want to encourage you that this message is not going to really totally make sense to you unless you go back and listen to last week's message. And so I want you to go back and listen to uh, uh, the, the best looking, most awesomest, finest woman in the world. To me, my girl, my lady. Man, last week I wasn't the first, she wasn't the first lady, I was the first husband. Come on, somebody, I was the first man. And, uh, and I got a word for you today, um, soul satisfaction. We kicked off this series called Gifted. And, and the kind of the idea of this series is, is what has already been gifted to us that we have failed to open because it wasn't relevant to us when it was gifted to us. It's crazy how in Christmas we make this list as if, you know, we've never had these needs before. And then we make this list of everything we want, not necessarily everything we need. And isn't it crazy to me that in a time of Christmas when you're asking for gifts, if you needed it, you probably would have already bought it. But you want it, so you put it on a list for somebody else to buy it. Right? And I don't know about you, but I'm not the kind of person that wants to get what I need. I can buy that for myself. You know, one, <laughs> one year my wife bought me a Vitamix. I was 400 pounds. I know I needed it, but I was a little salty when I opened it and said Vitamix. When I started thinking about the gifts that God gives us, God never just gives us anything we want until he first dresses what we need. And I think that in this Christmas season, all of us have these things that we want. We want a financial blessing because of COVID cra uh, co the craziness of COVID-19. We want healing, and I get that, and we need healing. And we want all these things, but could it be that God doesn't want to satisfy our situation until he first satisfies our soul? Could it be that the thing that you're praying for is not actually the thing that you need? 
I don't believe that God wants to give us a remedy. I believe that God, let me say it this way. I don't believe that God wants to give us relief. God wants to give us a remedy. Relief, what does relief do? It actually gives me a break from pain. Remedy and resolve absolves the pain. And so I started thinking about this, and, and God, how are we praying? He's like, man, I think some of my people are praying wrong. We're praying God to change the situation, but God really wants to change us through the situation. But my soul is not situational. Years ago, I'm talking about years and years ago, I, was, I think I was 15 or 16, and, and man, I, I saw all my friends with these bicycles called mongoose. And you ever heard of that? It's a, it, it, now, back in the day, my, mongoose was the bike. Now they sell mongoose everywhere, where back then you had to go to a specialty bike store to get a mongoose. And so I remember getting prepared for Christmas, and, and I wanted a mongoose. All my friends had mongooses, but what I really didn't know back then is my father and my mom did not have the resources to buy me a mongoose, but I still put it on my list. And so, man, I was so excited. I had expectation. I had anticipation that I was going to get this mongoose. And so what I could hear when I went to bed is I could hear my dad putting together a bicycle. I could hear the tools going out. And man, I, I got up and a Christmas morning, come on somebody, I got up with, with great expectation. I had anticipation that I'm going to get this mongoose. And so I, I woke up and I ran out and, and, and you, know, uh, we, you know, we used to get together as a family before you could open gifts and everybody would say, Merry Christmas. And my dad and my mom and my sister, Merry Christmas. And I saw this bike with this big old bow on it that wasn't a mongoose. It was a Kmart blue light special. Come on, somebody. And I was thinking about this, man. I know I asked for a mongoose. All my friends have a mongoose. But yet, I have to figure out how I'm going to make my bike cool. So what I did was, is that one of my friends had some mongoose stickers. So I took the mongoose stickers, and I covered up my fongoose, fake mongoose, with a mongoose sticker. And then I took a, 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 come on somebody, a playing card. And I strapped that playing card to the spokes so it could sound powerful. Brrr. And you would put it right near there and you take a paper clip. Come on, where y'all at? Uh-huh. And, and you would strap the playing card. And so what it did is it sounded powerful, but it really wasn't powerful. It looked like the original, but it really wasn't authentic. It was a knockoff version of what I really wanted. And the crazy thing is, is it looked like a mongoose. It sounded like a mongoose. But when it got out in life, when it got out on the road, all my friends' mongooses performed like a mongoose, but mine didn't because my father had gifted me something that he could only afford that I wanted. But come on, somebody, but, but, but he couldn't afford, so he got me what he could. And I realized I could ride. I could get from point A to point B. My tires work like everybody else's tires, and even though it wasn't name brand, how come I was not satisfied with what I had? And I feel like in this COVID crazy season that many of us, we've looked at Instagram and Facebook and, and we see other people's lives and throughout lives we've seen what other people have and what we want is now based on what somebody else, is, what somebody else has and so we're not satisfied with what we have. So what we do is we dress up and we put stickers on uh, 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 because now we, now we don't feel like we have many wins in life so we outwork what's been given to us. We've got decals of somebody else's life. And we're not satisfied with our peace. We're not satisfied with how God made us. And we like to dress it up and, and everything we do is based off of what everyone else has or everything that, and if you're honest, and here's the deal, this is a tough word in the beginning, I promise it'll get better, but uh, maybe God is trying to bless us but he can't find us because we're trying to be somebody else. And we don't have soul satisfaction. We've got situational satisfaction. If I get that job, sticker. If I get that stimulus check, sticker. Come on, somebody. Now we like to sound prolific. I speak in tongues. I'm really, I know all the words to the songs. I've been in church my whole life. 
and we sound powerful and we don't realize that, man, man, man I, that's really not who I am. Who am I in my soul? Here's the question. If I never saw a mongoose, would I have been okay with what my father gave me from day one? Come on, Zoom. Come on, online. What would you do if you never saw what anyone else did? Who would you be if you never had a model other than God and the Holy Spirit for you to be? I want to remove the stickers. I want to take off the things that we put on our lives to make us sound powerful or make us, you know, uh, act like we have it all together, but we don't. And if we're honest right now, I don't believe God can really give us what we need or what we want if, you, if we don't refer first address what we need. Jeremiah 6, the prophet Jeremiah says, stop. He says, stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old godly way and walk in it. Travel its path and you will find rest for your souls. When I read this scripture, I thought about the crossroads that many of us are facing right now. The crossroads of decisions, the crossroads of financial decisions, the, the crossroads of, of counseling, the crossroads of, man, I, I've got faith, but I also got some fear. I know I got a purpose. I know Jeremiah 29, 11, but I also, I'm experiencing a little bit of pain right now. The cross of, of abundance, the crossroads of abundance, but man, people in my family have died to COVID-19 or people that I know, and, and right now, I, 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 man, I, I'm at the intersection of insecurity. Crossroads. What I've come to find out is many of us are at the intersection of insecurity. Insecurity is simply what we felt sure about in one season. We're not now unsure about in this season. The truth of two realities. And I feel like in the body of Christ, you know, we want to hymn everything away. That's, that's sing old hymns and it is well with my soul and it is and, and great is thy faithfulness. And yes, I have faith, but yeah, because I have faith, should I not acknowledge my fear? Because I've got a purpose and a destiny, should I not acknowledge my disappointment and my discouragement? Hmm. Because I know how to praise God, and I'm praising him before I get it, should I ignore that I'm praising on Sunday, but on Monday, I'm struggling? The truth of two realities is that sometimes... The package gets delivered on time that'll change your life. And at other times, you're like, did it get lost in the mail? The truth of two realities is that sometimes, even uh, uh, when you hear a life-filled, life-giving message, and you're in a life-giving season, and something dies. Maybe it's not a person or a loved one, but it's a dream. Maybe it's not a dream, but it's your hope and something that you felt secure about, come on, last April, before all this happened, but now you're uncertain. The truth of two realities at the crossroads, at an intersection of insecurity, where faith and fear are at one another, where flesh and spirit are at one another, where pain and purpose are at one another, and feeling uncertain about tomorrow. What I'm learning is feeling uncertain about tomorrow is not a lack of faith today. Let me say that again, because some of you are like, Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, I'm going to show you in Scripture. I said being uncertain about tomorrow is not a lack of faith today. Some of y'all can get delivered right there, because you thought you had to have it all together. You thought, man, you had to just get up and declare and ignore re the reality, the, the truth of two realities. The reality that you have covenant with your spouse, but you can't stand your spouse. Uh-huh. The reality that you know the scripture, those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. And you're single and you've been in, uh, 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 in a waiting season and you're saying, God, I'll wait on you, but can I at least get the tracking number of when he or she are coming? 
truth of two realities that I'm saved, sanctified, redeemed, and blood bought. But I'm scared. I've got fear. I've got a little unforgiveness. And God, where do I, where, are, where am I at in the truth of two realities? Which road, which road do I go on? Have you ever been in a situation where you're confronted with it could go either way? Come on, somebody. This could go really good. This could be a time where I lay hands. Or this could be a time where I throw hands. Come on, somebody. The truth of two realities here. You have to understand the context of where the people of God are. The, the people of God, the Israelites, have been worshiping false idols. The people of Israel are about to be given over to their attackers because of their continued ungodliness. <laughs> the people of God, they had the teachings of God, but ignored the crossroads. And in Jeremiah 6, Jeremiah, who was a prophet, Jeremiah, who came to declare the word of the Lord, He's warning the people of an impending attack. And this is not just any warning. This is like the last warning. The army, the Babylonians, are raising up against the people of God. They are on the verge of being destroyed because they have turned away from God's commandments. Watch this. Jeremiah is giving them a prophetic warning. Word. Don't you think that that prophetic word would say, take control, put your hands on it, and fight? God's going to give you a blessing more than you. Don't you think that that word would be at the end of the rainbow, there's a pot of gold, and I'm going to show you where the path is. I'm going to heal your marriage. I'm, I'm going to bring Boaz to your house. Come on, somebody. I, or Boshika. They're saying, this is hard, God. What are you going to do? And God says with a prophetic word, are you ready? Rest. What? What? Rest? The way that I feel and you want me to stop? You're not telling me to strive? You're not telling me to go harder? What? Stop at the crossroads? Sit down? Have some time of silence and solitude? What? I already feel lonely and you're telling me to stop? I've, I've waited my whole life and you're telling me to stop? What? Not go to church more, not get more services, stop. I wonder if this crazy COVID season, is this just a, a stop sign from God? I wonder if God is just saying, you wouldn't slow down, so let me cause you to stop. What? Not fight? Not get more ammunition? Not equip yourself with people? What, what, stop. Stop. But I've come to find out is soul care is the remedy for situational chaos. I said soul care is the remedy for situational chaos. Soul care is not a sticker. Soul care is not a playing card that gets attached to the wheel that makes things go forward in your life, soul care is the person who's on the bike. It has nothing to do with where you are or who you're connected to or what you're riding on as you're going through the intersections of the crossroads of chaos or the intersections of insecurity. Can I tell you that stuff won't fix how you feel? A new house won't fix how you feel. A husband won't change how you feel. A wife won't change how you feel. It's about soul care. 
You are not a body with a soul. You are a soul with a body. And I'm all for fitness. Well, not really. But many people are trying to work out away their pain, their frustration. And can I tell you, there's no amount of cardio that can cause you to forgive. There's no amount of alcohol that you give your body that can cause you to reason away the pain that you're feeling right now. There is no amount of relationships or sexual encounters that can cause you to deal with the pain that is in your soul. You may feel better in the moment, but that's a sticker. That's a decal. You're still stuck with a fongoose, what God gave you. I was thinking about the soul. And I was thinking about in Genesis chapter 2, like, God, show me where this word soul is. And, and there's this law of first mention in Scripture when you're taught to preach to always go to the first time a word is used. And that's when that word is used there, it's actually the most significant or the most powerful or the word in its authentic form. And so I saw here in Genesis chapter 2, uh, it says this, when God made man, it says this, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust in the ground. And watch this, he breathed, somebody say he breathed. Come on, Zoom room. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a what? He didn't become a living body. He didn't become an Adonis. Come on. He didn't have a bunch of muscles. He became a soul. And even when I'm talking to my singles, I wonder if we're more concerned with his financial situation or his body situation or his family situation rather than his soul situation. God says he became a living soul. The word soul there in the Hebrew is a word nefesh, which means to breathe. Uh, uh, it means to become alive. Uh, the crazy thing is, watch this, when God breathed into man, he became a living soul. It was about increase. See, when we are born, we begin to increase, but also we have a termination date where we decrease. Right? And, and anybody who, who has lost a loved one, uh, you know, we, I, I've lost a, even a friend uh, in this crazy COVIDness, one of my good friends who committed suicide back in June. And man, I've been struggling with that. And, and you know, when you look at the tombstone, we say that our life is a dash between two dates, the day we were born and the day we die. But I don't see when God breathed into man, he's not dying. It doesn't start the countdown of when he's done. Come on, somebody. It, it, it doesn't say he's declining. It doesn't say when God breathed into him, he's tired from a long day. He became living. I'm praying in this season that God give you new life. I'm praying in this season that you become living, that you're not worrying about when this is over, but you're saying, God, give me enough strength to live and to thrive through this crazy COVID season. God, God, he became living. Here's the crazy thing. Man's first day, he becomes living. Come on, somebody say day one. Day one, here's man, boom, here he is, living. First day, man, look at God. Look at everything God created. Watch this now. He breathed in the man. Here I am. In the very first day, he was created on the sixth day. The very next day, he doesn't go out and find a job. He doesn't even go to counseling. He doesn't get his resume. He doesn't get his master's degree or his doctorate. The very first day of creation, he chills with God on a day of rest. What? 
I thought rest was for when we're finished working hard. No, that's recovery. What? Sunday is not the last day of the week. It's the first day of the week. You mean to tell me the very first day he doesn't go out and do something for God? No. The first thing that man did upon creation was to be with God. The only thing that could satisfy his soul was his introduction to God. Man, I have to spend time with the one who breathed life in to me. Oh, I remember when Irene had our first kid, Kayla. Yes, I was a part of the process at some point. Yes, I was home. Uh, 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 I, I had been home and, and you know, uh, making sure that the room was painted and, and, and her name decal is, is on. Come on, somebody is on the wall and, and making sure that everything was together. But the very first thing after Kayla came out of the womb is just spent time with her creator, her mother. And I remember uh, we were all about, you know, natural, you know, feeding uh, back then. And, and, and the very first thing, the doctor said, you know, the very first thing is it's time for her to eat. And what did she do? She just held her close to her chest. Man, God, restore me to the joy of my salvation. That, that time when I met you, God, I would just want to be there. I want you to hold me close. I, I, I want to I, I have intimacy. Isn't it crazy that before God gave that man a name, he gave him comfort? See, all of us, what we're struggling with right now is identity. God, who am I through this? What are you doing through this? Identify this season. Everybody wants a definition. Uh-huh. But God says, no, you will never get identity until you first have intimacy. God didn't give this man a name until he spent time with him. Spiritual truth, guys. Here's the spiritual truth. If I recognize that it was the breath of God that gave me life, then I must resolve that it's only the breath of God that sustains my life. If I recognize that it is the breath of God, come on somebody, that gave me life, then I've got to resolve in my spirit that jobs don't give me life, that relationships don't give me life, that financial blances don't give me life. You know what gives me life? Intimacy with God. And when I have intimacy, then I have identity. And no matter what gift I get under the tree, that doesn't define who I am. I don't need a decal. I don't need another name. I don't need another house. I don't need another job. I don't need a relationship. Come on, somebody. All I need is time with my creator. Soul care. So, pastor, how do I replenish my soul? How many of y'all would admit, come on, in the, in the studio audience, if you're online, you can, you can go type there in the chat, just raise your hand or say, that's me. If you're on Zoom, say, that's me. How many of y'all would admit right now that your soul feels empty? I'm raising my hand. And when you don't raise your hand, I honestly think I should, you should be preaching this message and not me. Man, my soul is empty. I want to give you a few pillars of soul care. Jeremiah 6.16 this is what the Lord says. He says, stop at the crossroads. Somebody say, stop. That, that's like a, a command. There's no suggestion. Hey, I think, you should, I think you should stop maybe. I think you, maybe you should slow down. Come on, how many of you had said, uh, have ever said in a crazy season, uh, you know what, I, I just need to slow down. Come on, where y'all at, where y'all at, where y'all at? I, I just need to slow down. I just need a minute. Come on, <laughs> that's what I say. I just need a minute. How many of y'all in a troubled situation, you better give me a minute. 
Where y'all who got kids? Come on, where y'all who got kids? You better give me a minute. I need a minute. How many of y'all are the kind of people when you come home from work and no matter if you got kids or don't have kids, I just need a minute by myself. I just need a second. Isn't it crazy that when God says stop, it's not a period of time. Stop tripping. Stop worrying. Stop striving. Stop complaining. Stop. What are the areas in your life that you just need to stop? Stop. Not pause. Because when you say pause, you're waiting on when God's going to say go. Wait. W-A-I-T. Some of y'all need to do this. Stop talking. Why am I talking? Wait. Come on, somebody. Say wait. Why am I talking? I can't hear God while I'm talking. Those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Shut up. Stop talking because it's not the enemy who's ruining your life. It's your words who are saying, I'll never. And this is because as a man talks, that's what is in his heart. And what you say is what you get. Stop. I'm preaching to myself. Stop overthinking it. Stop losing sleep over it. Stop awfulizing. Stop catastrophizing. Stop having anxiety at night. Stop multitasking. Stop. Lay on God's heart and let him hold you. Psalms 46.10 says, surrender your anxiety. Be silent and stop striving. And you will see that I am God. I am the God above all the nations. And I will be exalted throughout the whole earth. Not you be exalted. I will be exalted. Let me ask you a question. What in your life is bringing you stress? Come on. What in your life is keeping you up at night? You know what I have found in my own, own life? And I don't know if this is just a principle or my principle, so I'm going to share it as if it could be. What I have found is the things, are y'all listening? The things that bring me the most stress in stressful seasons. Over here are the things that bring me the least amount of life when things aren't stressful. I said the things that stress you out the most about life or in life are oftentimes the things that bring you the most, the least amount of fulfillment when life is amazing. Think about the things you're stressed out about right now. If those things weren't stressful, it wouldn't change your situation at all. So stop. Come on, Zoom rooms. Stop. Stop tripping. Stop worrying. Come on, Rebecca. I see God speaking to you right now. Stop. Come on, Neil, stop. Andrew, stop. Kevin, stop. Irene, stop. God has something for you. He wants to be with you. But we're missing it. A red light is not a suggestion. And the reason that the red light is there 
is so that you can stop enough to get signs to see the directions of what's supposed to happen next. And if you don't stop, you can't decipher what to do next. You cannot get direction from God slowing down. On the seventh day, he simply stopped. And what I'm trying to ask you, if creation was good enough for God to say every day, good enough, why is it not good enough for you? Stop. Psalms 46.10 says, surrender your anxiety. Be silent and stop. This is the Passion Translation. Stop striving and you will see that I am God. I am the God above all nations and I will be exalted. Mark 8, 36 and 7. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Uh-huh. Is dating the wrong person because you're starving? Worth more than losing your soul. Stop. Number two. Stop at the crossroads. And then he says, look around. Somebody say, look around. Some of y'all, especially in the Zoom room online, you're looking around right now and all you can see is dirty dishes. Come on, somebody. Look around. The word look around. I was like, God, what are you trying to say to me through this? He said this. He said, take inventory. Here's what I want you to do this week. I want you to take inventory of what you see. Pastor, what, what are you talking about? This is what I did for 37 days when I just had to stop. I'm going to be very transparent. I'm telling you right now in September, I felt like I was about to have a nervous breakdown. I could not sleep all night. I, I was so tired but could not sleep. My mind, if I woke up to use the bathroom in the middle of the night, I could never go back to sleep because my mind started awfulizing and ruminating and, 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 I, and I had anxiety. I started gaining weight again. My, my, my countenance was down and to the point where my kids were like, Dad, what is going on? I said, I don't know. I felt angry. My language like was like abusive. I wasn't my normal self. And when I took that time to stop, you know what I did? I just looked around. And I started to notice what I'm grateful for. I started to take inventory and see God's resume in my life of everything that he has blessed me with. And although this season is uncertain, the last season was certain. I was certainly sure that if God did it before, he'll do it again. You see, the enemy doesn't have to make you sin to take you out. He just sometimes has to make you busy. Because if he makes you busy, you, you know, what was faith, what, what faith produced in the last season, fear can't even conjure up in this season. But when you stop, I just want about, come on, a couple thousand people who are listening to this message or right now, whether in the studio, online, or on Zoom, I just want you to think of the goodness of God and what he has done for you. And if he never does another thing for you, he has done enough. Somebody take inventory. Take inventory. Look around. He's already done. He's already given you peace. Check this scripture out. John 14, 27. I am leaving you a gift. Somebody say a gift. That means I don't have to earn it. I don't have to, I don't have to do anything to deserve it. It's mine. I don't have to pay for it. It's mine. Somebody say it's mine. I am leaving you a gift. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give. You cannot get peace from a paycheck. You cannot get peace. Come on, somebody. In marriage, you cannot get peace. That's not peace. 
It's actually a decal. You can't get peace from a new car. You can't get peace from a, from a, from a raise. That's a benefit, but that's not peace. God says this, peace I give to you. You already have peace. I'm telling you right now, when I start to think about, you know, uh, when I take inventory, uh, me, me and Irene, you know, we moved a, a while back ago, and, and you know, I was hanging pictures, and I went to the hardware store, and I got all these wall anchors. The last thing I want is when I hang a picture for it to fall. Come on, somebody. So I got these wall anchors that you screw in, and it's like 200 pounds per anchor. And then I went to the next room about three months later. How many of y'all have projects that you said you was going to do in one season, but you find yourself... Yeah. So I picked the project back up about three months later. Come on, somebody. And, and, I, and, and I had forgotten that I had already bought wall anchors. So I went to the hardware store, and I got the same thing I had already bought in the last season. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. In the last season, and I hung a picture. Then I put the tools down. Three, four months later, I wanted to hang the next picture that I was supposed to hang two times ago. And I forgot that I had wall anchors. So I went to the hardware store and I bought wall anchors as if I never had wall anchors. And then I realized I've already had this. Why am I still looking for something that I already have? Church, you already got peace. You already got joy. You already got strength. Why are you trying to search for something that Jesus paid for over 2,000 years ago? Look around. Stop. Look around. The next thing he says is ask. Ask for the old godly way. Somebody say ask. When was the last time you asked God to spend time with him rather than want something from him? You want soul satisfaction? You got to ask. God, this is what I've been, this has been my prayer. Y'all forgive me. I know I'm a pastor. God, I know I have neglected time with you. I know I have forsaken time with you for doing work for you. But God, can you visit me? Can you just show up right here? Can you, can you, can you, can you? Can you somehow comfort me in this season? I don't want anything else but to feel you. My son, I love my kids. My son, I love Kayla. I love my, I love my children. They're amazing. But they always want something from me. Every single time. How many of y'all know that when you got kids, you know when they show love, it's a setup for something else? I hate this, but like if any three of them text me, I love you, Dad. I just bypass that because I'm waiting for the next text and I see the bubbles. Come on, somebody. Like, what do you want? My kids are listening to me. You know what I want right now? I just want time with you, man. Time's running out. Y'all are getting old. My son's about to go to college. Kayla's going to college. Maya's 15. I, I just want to know. I'll give you whatever. But if you make me your priority, kids, I'll make you mine. I just want time. I just want time. This is real. I see them growing up so fast, and I just want time because I created them. Can you imagine how God doesn't need us? He is love. He doesn't need us. He's amazing. But for some reason, he created us not to do anything, but just so we would spend time with him. I just want to spend time, man. I try to like come and, and give my son the understanding that I, I'm not mad at you. I'm just upset that you don't want to spend time with me. I know video games are amazing, and I know you got a girlfriend, and I know you know you got soccer, but man, if we can just sit on the couch and talk. I wonder if God sometimes feels taken advantage of. Like the only time we spend time with him is when we want something. I want to find rest for my soul. I'm in a place right now where I got this joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? I got the peace that passes understanding. 
down in my heart, down in my heart to stay. I've got the love of Jesus, love of Jesus down in my heart. The last thing I want you to do is I want you to walk. I'm going to ask Shannon to come. I, I got this thought in my head yesterday. Like, I, I want you to see a picture of what it means for something to be well with your soul. He says, this is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old godly way and walk with it. Travel its path and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus said to me, in Matthew 11, put this up there, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. I started looking up the definition of weary and tiredness and heavy laden and burden, and you know what the word I came up with is grief. The reason why our souls are agitated is because we're grieving. We're not grieving events. We're grieving thinking that God gave somebody else a mongoose and left us with this phony thing. Can I just encourage you that you did not come off an assembly line? You are soul satisfaction as you're waking up, seeing the gift, and being content with what you have, no matter what nobody else has. This is my story. This is my song. This is my portion. This is my peace. This is my family. If your family is jacked up, guess what? You got one. This is yours. If your mind is jacked up, guess what? Somebody else died in the thing that you're still walking in today. This is mine. So I went to, while I was off, And I started taking golf lessons. I played golf for about 20 years, but I'm tired of being average. I'm tired of winning sometimes and losing other times. So I said, can you give me lessons? So I'm at lessons. What I have in my hand is a seven iron. And this seven iron in golf with my swing is supposed to go about 180 yards. And so in my first lesson, the guy puts the seven iron in my hand. And he says, let me see your grip. No, I want to hit the ball long. He says, let me see your grip. Nuh-uh, I want you to see my power. He says, no, let me see your grip. Then he says, let me see your stance. What does my stance have to do? I want to hit the ball long. And he says, go ahead and swing. And he put me on this thing called a swing tracker. And man, I was swinging, I'm telling y'all, 180, 120, 180, 150. I'm going to get this thing 180. I got to hit this thing as far as I can. 180, shank, 10 yards. He said, sir, you don't realize how you hit the ball further. He said, you got to slow down and loosen your grip. God, I want to go further. I want to dream bigger. Slow down. Loosen your grip like it's not yours. And let the momentum do the work. Let the Holy Spirit do the work. And it's crazy. It looks like I don't have any effort when I'm swinging. But I've been hitting it 180, 190, 200 yards. Not because I'm trying harder, but because I'm going slower. And I listen, like, what, what, what do you mean, Jeremiah? Stop. Stop? What? Stop? I ain't stopping. I'm going to try harder. Can you imagine the 
Gideon's army, when they're down to 300, and he, he tells them, okay, here's the weapons. A trumpet and a lantern. with a trumpet and a lantern? Yeah. See, when you slow, you get direction. When you slow, you find the path. You can stop striving. I want you to take a deep breath. I'm going to ask the team to come sing this song, then I'm going to come back. Slow, 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 slow. Stop.
would be a good time to lay on the chest of your creator right here. God, it may not be well with my situation, but let it be well with my soul. It's crazy to me that Mary's response and being utilized in bringing Jesus and fulfilling the purpose of Jesus, she says, let it be unto me. Not according to my finances, not according to the condition of my mind, but according to your word. I want y'all to listen to me right now. No matter whoever listens to this, I want you to tune into my words right now. I was sitting in counseling in October and just contemplating, man, I, I, God, what are you saying to me? What are you, I'm, I'm, I, my mind is Jack COVID, like I'm losing friends, I'm, I'm the pastor, I got to carry the weight of this, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't know what I want to do, God, help me through this. And, and my counselor said something powerful. He said, Jimmy, stop. He said, everything in your life is about what's next and striving. Just stop, just stop, stop. Slow down. And I said, how? And he said, what I want you to do, instead of reading scripture, I want you to write it. <laughs> no one ever said that to me before. He's like, because you can't write fast. Don't type it in a computer. Get a journal and write it. So I got the Bible out, and me and I read her in the hotel room, and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm trying to write. And the crazy thing is, in a whole week, I could only write three verses. But you know what I felt in my spirit? Three verses. I didn't have Greek or, or Hebrew or hermeneutics, or I didn't have a spirit. All I had was trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto your own understanding Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your path. And then the next time I went to my last session and he says, now don't read it. I mean, now don't write it. I want you to read it slow. And without my counselor, he, he took me to this and I want to I speak this into you. Psalms 43, 5. I want to show you what happens when you read slow. Psalms 43. Five. Why? Why am I here? Why am I tripping? Is this real? Why? Can y'all just say with me why? Why? You know what I've been doing? I've becoming self-aware. Is this really what somebody else said or somebody else did? Or is this me? Why? Oh, I've been coming. My kids think I'm like crazy because I'm like, like, like just philosophizing. I don't even know there's a word. I'm just like, why? Why am I crying? Why am I angry? Why am I frustrated? See, when you're slowing down, now watch this. Why? My soul. You mean, not what they're doing? My soul. What if I don't get that job? My soul. My soul. Breathe into my soul. I, I, I've come to find out that if I don't slow enough down to say why, and then my soul, I will make situational decisions and not soul decisions. Oh. Why, my soul? Are you downcast? You downcast? I, I wrote in my I wrote in my in my notes here. Downcast? Question mark. With all the faithfulness downcast? <laughs> Disappointment? Why? My soul downcast. 
If he did it before, he'll do it again. Downcast? If he healed you the last time, you think that that grace doesn't outlast and continue through this diagnosis? Downcast? Question mark? Somebody say downcast. COVID-19, downcast? Layoff, downcast? My soul? Not my situation? So, so, why do I let my mind go so past reality? Oh, when you read slow, so, why? So downcast, so awful, so reactive. So broke. Why do I let everything go so far? Why do I let my mind go so off to awful? And 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 why 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 my soul my soul my soul so? It's my soul. Why have I spent so much time out of the presence of God? My soul. It is well put. That means I've placed it somewhere wrong. Hey, when you slow down, man, God's word speaks to you. I put it in the wrong thing. I put my hope in that relationship. I put my hope in that marriage. I put my hope in that job. Put your hope in Jesus. The one who gave you life is the only one who can sustain it. I want to pray for you. God, I just thank you for where you have me right now. I have never been more content. I have never been more sure. I have never in my life been more peaceful. And if anything flows from the head down, let it be the peace that I have right now to my church. God, the peace that I mean having our marriage, God, let, oh, my soul. My soul. Not my situation, my soul. Not my paycheck, my soul. Not my marriage, my soul. God, do what only you can do. Make it live again. Make it breathe again. anybody who's far from Jesus. He wants to give you identity to the point that you don't need a decal. You don't need to sound powerful. You are enough. The gift that I wish I could give you this Christmas is no matter what life brings you, I'm enough. If your relationship is far from God and you want a relationship with Jesus, I just want you to type in the chat, I need Jesus. Just say, I need Jesus, right there in the chat. Or you can text, I need Jesus, to 97000. I need Jesus. Huh. I, if that's you, I just want to pray for you. And you can repeat after me. Matter of fact, let's everybody do it. Say, Father, today I stop and you start. I take my hands off of my life and I put my trust in you. 
You are my Savior. You are my Lord. You are my King. You are my forever. And my heart is secure in eternity because I trust you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said a good amen.